Um, so our next speaker is Delbert Robinson, uh, who is a professor of psychiatry at the Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, uh, and also at the Zucker Hellside Hospital, uh, who is one of the, the uh, principal investigators of the RAIS ETP project. And he'll be talking about the psychopharmacologic treatment in RAISE ETP outcomes of a manual and computer decision support system based intervention. Delbert. Uh, thank you, John. And in terms of disclosures, uh, I have been a consultant for a few companies. Uh, and you've heard uh, early this, this morning and just about, John, about Ray's ETP, and that's the study we're going to be talking about. And again, uh, one of the things about Ray's ETP is we're looking at a, a comprehensive treatment program. So I'm going to be talking about the medication part, but also patients were getting uh, individual therapy, they were getting supported um, education and employment, and uh, they were also, their, they and their families were getting psychoed. So it's very important to realize that what we're talk when I'm talking about medications, that's just a piece of a whole group of services that the participants were getting. Uh, and as John said, um, the treatment period that we're going to be talking about is the first two years of patient participation in the program. Um, this is just a slide again of the different locations of the, the site. And also, it, it's very important for uh, the audience to understand all the sites were community facilities. And none of them had pre existing first episode programs. Uh, and in the usual context in the United States is that these facilities are outpatient only and they don't have an associated inpatient unit. So usually what happens is that people <clears throat> are treated on inpatient unit and then they're referred to a separate facility uh, for their continuing treatment. And RAISE was located all in these community facilities. Okay, and now, uh, I've, it, there have been obviously other um, comprehensive treatment programs and there's been studies of them. The parts that I think raise ETP differed from some of the other programs is as part of the program we developed uh, some really program specific medications and guidelines for the treatment of first episode. And one of our challenges uh, was that, again, these are community facilities, they're not academic facilities. And part of the thing was, well, once you develop these treatment guidelines that are specialized, how do you, how do you sort of get that information to very busy clinicians sort of in the field treating patients at community facilities? And our solution to that in Ray's ETP was to develop what we call Compass, which was a computer uh, decision support system that the prescribers and the patients used to make um, medication decisions. And built into that system was a lot of information about guidelines, which medicines to choose, the dose ranges to use for first episode, which are very different than multi-episode. And we'll talk a little more about Compass. But those were the sort of two elements of RAISE EDP that sort of differed from some of the other comprehensive programs. Now, uh, if any of you are interested in the details in terms of the medication treatment manuals and the algorithms, et cetera, those are all freely available as uh, one of the manuals for RAISE ETP. As Bob Heinsen in his lecture this morning said, uh, the National Institutes of Health have made them freely available to anybody, and you can go to the website and you can download the manual and get sort of all the details. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd talk just a little bit about the guideline development, just to give you a flavor of uh, what we what we did, and again, all the details are freely available uh, for download 
uh, from uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health and from raiseetp.org, uh, which is another website that has them. Now, one of the things is when we were developing the guidelines, we wanted to give clinicians, patients, and their supporters the, best, the biggest flexibility possible in terms of making medication decisions. So what we did was we put medications into groups. And basically, uh, prescribers, their patients, et cetera, they were, it was suggested that they consider medications in the first group to try first, and then there was another group, second, that if the first one didn't work. And again, we tried to put as many medicines as we thought had an evidence base in each of those groups. And again, just to give you a feel for what it was like in terms of developing the groups, Basically, the basic philosophy was uh, first episode uh, pharmacology differs from multi-episode pharmacology. There are different uh, medication choices, uh, different doses, et cetera. So the big thing was why not use medicines that have an evidence base among either first episodes or adolescents with psychotic disorders because there you have the information to really understand uh, the dosing, side effect profiles, et cetera. So just, again, using that sort of basic philosophy uh, for like choosing what would be the first line medicines, essentially this is a list of all the medicines that at the time raised and developed had good data from large studies about, uh, for the treatment of either people with first episode psychosis or adolescents with psychotic disorders. And basically, we took them, and then we sort of looked at the side effect profile, and some of the medicines we felt became second line based on that. For example, uh, chlorpromazine uh, has its own side effects. Uh, clozapine, which has no particular efficacy, as a first-line drug for, for, for first-episode patients, where it does if, they, if a patient has failed several different antipsychotics. Uh, olanzapine, because of its adverse metabolic profile, was considered to be a second-line drug. And haloperidol, because data showing that it's potentially less efficacious as a maintenance treatment than some of the other antipsychotics. So again, those went into the second line. And basically, what you ended up with was the first-line medicines ended up being either aripiprazole, quetiapine, risperidone, or zeprazidum. Now, those medicines differ a lot in terms of their side effect profile and other properties. So again, uh, clinicians and patients had a large range to choose from within the first group. Then if this first group didn't work, then there was a second-line group. And actually, the third line group consisted really of clozapine as a suggested medicine, because at that time, people would have failed two, uh, tr two trials of different antipsychotics. And again, the details are all available, but again, just to give you a feel for what the manual is like. Now, again, we said it's not only important to know the exact medicine to choose, but obviously there are lots of things about dosing, side effect profiles, etc. And again, thinking about how a busy uh, clinician could access that information, we developed Compass. And it, it, it's actually a program that uh, patients and uh, the clinicians access uh, through a standard web browser, um, you know, Internet Explorer, uh, Safari, etc. Oops. Oh, and this is a diagram of the patient flow in the Navigate visit. Basically, a patient came in, then they got registered in the system, and then the patient actually, there's a self rating form that the patient completed before they saw the prescriber. Now, again, this is all being done. Um, the form, essentially, again, they're doing it directly onto either a laptop, uh, an iPad, et cetera. The data goes to the central server, and then all that data is then processed 
and it's displayed on the prescriber's computer screen uh, before the patient arrives. And also, it, because it's a computer program, what the, what the prescriber discusses with the patient is informed by what the patient had said in their patient self-report. Then after, after the evaluations are done, then the decision support system gives suggestions based on the patient's history, uh, their preferences in terms of treatment, et cetera. And then after that, then, then the patient and the prescriber make a decision about the treatment plan. Okay, Just to give you a feel for what the computer screens look like, this is what the patient self-report form is. Basically, it's a series of questions, uh, and then there is a series of answers, which is essentially in a yes-no format. The, the reason it's put into this format is this is a format that people with a third grade education can answer questions. So, and as you know, some of our patients, unfortunately, have truncated education because of their illness onset. So basically, this is, this is some of the symptoms. Uh, patients talked about their symptoms. There is another section where they uh, report whether they've experienced any one of 21 different side effects during the past 30 days. Uh, there's sections where they talk about their adherence to medicine, their attitudes towards their medicine, uh, si uh, substance misuse, and also their preferences in terms of would they like to have a medication change, would they like to keep on the same medicine, et cetera. Again, all this information is then sort of digested, so to speak, and this is what the clinician sees before they see the patient. Uh, these, these are updating of the labs. When they're doing their assessment of all the symptoms, et cetera, they already know what the patient had said on their patient self-report form. The questions they ask are modified based on the patient's response. There we go. And then this is just a screen where, uh, in terms of the uh, shared decision making, this is a screen where the patients input what are their priorities uh, in terms of the treatment at that visit. It can be either symptoms, side effects, et cetera. If it's a particular side effect, they choose it, and then the computer system knows that's the patient's pro you know, priority, and, they're ra and the patients are asked to rank them into number one being the most important, number two being the second most important to me, et cetera. So again, if you're interested in more details of the symptom that's, available, that's fully described uh, in the manual that, again, that's available for download. So one of the questions was, well, would this, would patients with psychotic disorders, one, would they, would this be an acceptable sort of treatment format for them? Uh, would they do it? And did it have any effect on prescribing? So the first question again was, you know, is this, is this at all feasible to do in a local mental clinic? mental health clinic. And basically what we found was that, uh, as John mentioned, 223 patients in, Ray, in Ray's ETP were, were uh, in the Navigate uh, treatment condition. And 96% of the patients had at least one or more uh, compass visits. So there's only 4% of the patients who never did it at all. And actually, during the two years of the study, uh, the Navigate participants finished 3,352 patient self-report forms. So again, that, that shows that this is very feasible and also uh, quite acceptable to patients. Uh, now the next thing, this looks at each month in the study the mean number of medication visits uh, participants were getting. Now, the red line is Navigate, and the blue line is community care participants. Now, basically, what you see is throughout the trial, 
uh, people in Navigate were actually seeing their prescribers more frequently than um, people in community care, and the difference is highly statistically significant. Uh, also, I should mention all the p-values that we're going to be talking about are ones that have been, are, have been adjusted for multiple comparisons. So we won't have to go over that for the rest of the talk. Uh, so basically, what our interpretation of this is that, you know, that this sort of model was quite acceptable to patients because they um, obviously were coming much more frequently. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of what medicines were actually prescribed, uh, we had data on both conditions. Once a month, uh, patients were asked in terms of the medications they were being prescribed, and both the medicine and the dose. So we have data comparing the two conditions. And basically, what we found is that patients in Navigate, compared to people in community care, were significantly more likely to be prescribed an antipsychotic. The odds ratio was, was 3.7. And then they were more likely to be, be prescribed uh, a, an antipsychotic. When they were prescribed an antipsychotic, it was much more likely to be one that was a Navigate preferred medicine in the, either the dose or the actual drug. Uh, and also, this is very interesting. Patients in Navigate were less likely to be prescribed uh, an antidepressant than people in community care. And in fact, the odds ratio was 0.4. Uh, and one of the things that's very interesting about the outcome of Navigate is, if you remember from Bob, uh, from Bob Heinsohn's talk this morning, people in Navigate actually did better than people in community care about depressive symptoms. So that was achieved in this comprehensive care model with actually having less antidepressant prescription. Okay? Now, in terms of the specific antipsychotics prescribed, there were no significant differences once we controlled for multiple comparisons. Although at a trend level, again, this is after correcting for multiple comparisons, people in Navigate tended to, to get, were more likely to get aripiprazole and less likely to get haloperidol than patients in community care. Uh, we also, in terms of the doses, the doses did not differ significantly when an antipsychotic was prescribed between the two conditions. We were, in, uh, when we first got that result, we were rather surprised. But one of the things that happened is that in community care, actually the, the mean doses were actually within the suggested first episode range. Uh, for example, it was about 10 milligrams a day of aripiprazole. Risperidone was essentially 3.3 milligrams. So the community care people were actually, when they prescribed an antipsychotic, they were doing it uh, pretty much in the approved dose range. And that's probably why we didn't find a difference about dosing. Uh, in terms of side effects, uh, I told you in Compass, uh, people were rating their side effects every month. But as part of the data collection at 3, 6, 12, 18, and 24 months, we got side effect assessments on patients in community care and in Navigate. And we compared, and essentially they were asked about 21 of the most common antipsychotic side effects. And what we found was there was a significant difference between the two conditions. Basically, when people entered the trial, they had equivalent numbers of side effects. By the end of the trial, essentially, people in Navigate had less side effects than people in community care. And this was, this was very sort of gratifying to us because patients were taking antipsychotics more, but they ended up having less side effects because of the side effect management strategies. Okay, next. So, in summary, as part of, again, Within the context of this comprehensive care model, a medication prescription can, I think, be optimized for first episode psychosis. And we show that that really seems to be associated with less side effect burden in this data. And it's also obviously one of the things that can, was contributing to the better outcomes in terms of symptoms 
uh, that's been reported in, you know, in John's uh, comprehensive care paper. In terms of help with this, these were the specific people who helped on Compass, as part of, who were part of the team. Ben and Ronnie at uh, UT Southwestern at Dallas, Alec Miller at uh, the health system of the University of Texas at San Antonio, and Majnu, who's the statistician who works with me at Northwell Health. And of course, this is the executive committee for the entire project, again, with John as the PI, and again, uh, the NIMH collaborator. So, Again, thank, I'm sort of here representing a whole group of people. So, so thanks. And I guess if we have any, we have the the the, the chair and co-chair says that we have we have one question. Okay. If not, then ah, oh, somebody's doing the prerogative of the of the one question. Okay. Um, so I was curious about something from the, the manual and then something that Dr. Kane brought up, which is the duration of time to look for an effect. In the manual, if I remember right, it talks about the idea that, and it cites a number of studies suggesting that maybe we even need to be looking out eight weeks to see maximum Correct. effect. And Dr. Kane was talking about potentially a two-week period here. Right, okay. Uh, the, the part in the manual is based actually on we had uh, a, an R01 grant from NIMH looking at, uh, at that time, uh, risperidone versus lanspine for first episode. And what we did was that we modeled time to response very, uh, in a very detailed manner. Uh, the, if you're very interested in the results, it was, it's been published. The first author is Juan Gallego, G-A-L-L-E-G-O, which has all the sort of scientific details. And based on that, what we found was that a lot of patients actually did, who were not responding even up to four weeks, sometimes eight weeks, if you continue them on the same antipsychotic at the same dose and just gave it more time, that actually you got response. So, but that's in a, that was in a specific first episode population. John is talking about in multi-episode patients, in actuality, there is a lot of data, in fact, you can read some of John's papers about that, that if you're not getting response within two weeks, that usually, that does predict non-response. But within the first episode sample, again, the mathematics worked out very differently. And so that's why the manual uh, ha talks about at least trying for eight weeks. And actually, there's some data that you can even go up to 16. And one thing, I congratulate you that you've read the manual with such care that you, that you got that part out. Well, I just had to train some people on it. So oh, okay. Because it, it, but congratulations, though. Thanks. Thank you. So the next speaker is Nina Schooler, uh, who's professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. And uh, Nina is also one of the principal investigators on the RAISE ETP project. Thank you. So what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon represents a, additional analyses that we've recently done, this time uh, looking at cognitive functioning. Um, which is, a, uh, I guess I can say, a well-established measure that people look at. And um, the question of what the effects would be in a clinical trial, um, my disclosures of uh, commercial interest. And what I want to do is a few things today. Um, first, I want to talk about... Um, this is better. I want to talk about cognitive de de definitions, how patients and families may define what cognitive problems are, um, 
offer a, an example, which is the uh, brief assessment for cognition and schizophrenia that we used, which has uh, neuropsychological functions which are presumed to underline uh, some of these issues. Um, talk a little bit about first episode psychosis and cognition, and then the RAISE ETP study is a setting for this. Uh, talk about our performance measures, what we saw in RAISE ETP over time, <clears throat> and then uh, questions that we think we can answer from these data going forward, and then offer to you uh, questions that might ha come forward later. So these are the kinds of things that patients and families will identify that I think to many of us translate into cognitive problems. Things like trouble concentrating, not being able to follow a sitcom, a situation comedy on the television um, for a half hour duration, um, inability to persevere in completing tasks like unable to complete laundry, and difficulties at work and school, which can be presumed to be underlined, underlaid um, by some of these kind of cognitive problems. Things like an inability to complete assignments, Teachers talk too fast to be able to process the information that's coming. <clears throat> so if you shift from that uh, to the definition of cognitive deficits that you see in the kinds of tests that we do, you see something that's dealing at a very different level of processing. And I just wanted to list here for you, before we go into the rest of the discussion, what the measures are um, in the BACs. And the BACs is actually a fairly good representative measure um, of cognitive deficits that can be used in schizophrenia. And it includes verbal memory, working memory, motor speed, verbal fluency, um, attention and processing speed, and then most importantly, uh, from my perspective, uh, things like executive functioning, reasoning, and problem solving. So this was the, me this was the um, instrument that we used. And um, this is, um, from my perspective, um, a brief, um, unannotated and unreferenced list of the things that I'm pers persuaded to take as known about this area in the field. One is that cognitive deficits in the tests like the BACs have been well established by the time of the first episode of psychosis. And there are a large number of studies that have shown this in ultra high risk patients, in um, high risk individuals, and of course in first episode. And the second is that deficits exist across all of these different domains. They may be more severe in some domains than others, but the deficits are not confined to a single domain, so that one could say that there is probably a generalized deficit. Um, the second is that um, short-term effects in first episode psychosis, when performance on these tests have been compared to normal controls who are tested repeatedly over relatively short periods of time, the improvement that you see in first episode psychosis is not notably different from the improvement that you see that can be attributed to practice effects in age-matched um, healthy controls. Um, uh, cognition is an important predictor of recovery in first episode uh, psychosis, and, and for this I will offer a citation. It's a study by Delbert Robinson that looked at recovery in which I would, I would argue, I don't know that he would, that cognition was indeed the most important predictor of recovery over an almost five-year span. Finally, it's um, uh, two more points. Correlated with functional outcomes in a large number of studies that have not specifically looked at treatment. And then finally, that we don't really have treatments that are truly functional um, uh, for uh, cognition. This is particularly true of pharmacologic treatments, which has been an area of great interest for the last few years but in which there's been very, very little, um, uh, there's been no uh, demonstrated efficacy of any agent uh, to date. So that brings us to Ray's, and by now you've seen this slide a number of times. Um, and just again, 
the one point that I want to remind you of here, because you've already heard about the upper points, is that the cognitive assessments that we did were completed at study entry, and that would be the point at which patients entered this trial. So these are not necessarily, um, these are not treatment naive patients. Study entry, 12 months and 24 months after um, uh, they've been in the study. Now, um, this is again um, further information about RAISE, which you have already seen, and the Navigate components. Um, I'm showing you this for, to make the same point that Delbert Robinson made a few minutes ago, and that is that what you've got is a wide array of treatment services, and it's particularly difficult to tie a given outcome to a particular intervention. It may actually be easier to do um, in terms of um, medication side effects and other things that can be um, channeled on medication uh, than it is for cognitive um, functioning as we've examined it here. Uh, these are the um, inclusion criteria. And um, uh, perhaps an important one that I don't know has been emphasized enough in our discussion so far is that there's no more than six months of antipsychotic medication taken. Um, these are the characteristics of the individuals. And I just want to mention uh, there are three that are shown here that are of, um, uh, of relevance. Um, we see a, a, a sorry, a gender difference between treatment, likelihood of role functioning is higher um, in the, um, in the uh, I'm, I'm sorry, likelihood of role functioning, i.e. Uh, being in school is higher in the community care group and there's a larger uh, percentage with a prior hospitalization um, in uh, community care. Two of these characteristics, um, uh, role functioning, uh, well, one of them, role function, role, uh, the being in school and also a PANS factor were controlled in the analyses that we've done uh, looking at cognition. The reason we did not control for gender is that all of the cognitive scores that you're going to see going forward are age and sex adjusted uh, compared to a large normal cohort. So these are T scores which have been age and sex adjusted. So there was no need um, uh, to adjust uh, for gender. And these are what people looked like at baseline. Um, the important point to note here is that norm, the, these are all normed against a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. So what you're seeing at the point that people enter the study is that in all of these domains, um, London is excluded from the base there. In all of these domains, in both conditions, um, patients are doing less well than would be expected by age and sex matched controls. Um, the only one uh, that is uh, significantly different between the two conditions was actually the Tower of London, and the little asterisk for the P obviously fell off the slide. So here what we see is change in the composite score um, at the end, at the three, at the uh, three time periods. So this is, the, this is the treatment by time interaction is significant. And what you see here is between baseline and 12, a greater change in navigate than in community care. Between baseline to month 24, again, an, a, a greater change. But it's clear that this change is largely attributable to this one, because the 12 to 24 is not significantly different. When we now turn, wrong button, when we now turn to the six composites, again here, what we see is a similar pattern in that in, um, several, in, most, in several of the cases, what you see is an advantage uh, for Navigate versus community care, particular in, particularly in the uh, Tower of London, uh, digit sequencing, and verbal memory. But the, fa but the fact of the matter is, is that for the community care group in baseline to six months, um, there isn't a significant improvement in the only significant 
within condition improvement is in the composite. And here what we see is the baseline to 24 months. My view is that the more important one to look at is the baseline to 12 because that's the area where the greatest improvement shows. So what we're seeing is that if you look at the, uh, to provide this again uh, in a more verbal way, in baseline to 12, you get improvement in Navigate in the composite and in the individual tests with the exception of the Tower of London, community care, composite, and a trend for simple symbol coding. Further advantages, uh, smaller uh, uh, changes if you look at baseline to 24, and between 12 and 24, no further uh, significant changes. So in summary, um, my view would be that the raise ETP assessments successfully incorporated a cognitive assessment in a community context. And um, uh, to this, um, um, I need to thank our colleagues at NeuroCog Inc. and Duke University, uh, Richard Keith and Anzali Khan. Um, Anzali also worked with us on the data analysis. These assessments at long intervals, namely 12 and 24 months, I think can serve to minimize practice effects. First episode subjects de demonstrated substantial improved impairment in all domains at baseline, again compared to their age and gender matched standards, and improvement was mediated by treatment as shown by the significant uh, treatment by group interaction. Um, a treatment by, I'm sorry, it should say treatment by time interaction. And the last point I should mention about that is that these interactions all controlled for the cluster randomization feature of the design. So that factor is included in the analyses. And these are the treatment by time interaction shorn of that cluster effect. Improvement occurs during the first 12 months with no further improvement during the uh, succeeding 12. So further analyses, and I think these will be um, uh, particularly important. One has to do with the relationship of cognition both to symptom outcomes and to functional outcomes over time. We know that we have, we have these, and the question is whether cognition at baseline serves as a moderator or whether cognitive change between baseline and 12 months serves as a mediating factor in the outcomes that we see in terms of um, symptoms and other functional outcomes. Um, and then the second thing that I think will be important here is although these the models that we used are generalizing generalized estimating equations, which make assumptions about missing at random and therefore take missing data into account. One has to consider that in terms of the um, uh, tested subjects who were available at the two time points, 12 and 24 months, there is substantial attrition. And that will become an important, um, an important thing to con consider. Um, so in summary, uh, Navigate, as you've now heard, a, concord a coordinated specialty care program improved cognitive test performance over time compared to usual community care in the US and further, understanding the effect of this change on other clinical outcomes remains to be demonstrated. And I'll stop there and hope that we're somewhat catching up on time, but I think I have time for a couple of questions, if there are some. Yes, please. We did. We did. We did not. We we don't have a measure. We don't have a measure of functional capacity, and um, we don't have formal measures either of um, patient or family perception um, of cognition. So what we what we have is the that was one of the reasons I wanted to provide the information about how patients and their families view these issues. Um, is that what we're looking at are these more basic cognitive functions, and the question is how those will relate. Certain other, th other moderators we won't be able to test for.
future research. Okay, with, with that, uh, let me um, uh, take the opportunity to introduce our uh, last speaker, who is uh, a Kim Muser, who is a professor at Boston University and uh, very instrumental in the design and operation of the Ray's ETP program. And it's a pleasure to introduce Kim, who also rescued my slides. Thank you very much, Kim. Thanks. It's uh, great to be here and to uh, see so much additional uh, research um, or outcomes from the, the RAISE ETP study. Um, so what I'm going to be focusing on here are the supported employment and education uh, outcomes from the RAISE ETP project and uh, from the, the Navigate uh, program, of course. Uh, these results have quite recently been uh, published in uh, Schizophrenia Research. Uh, the um, online uh, version with Bob Rosenheck as the uh, as the lead author. So uh, to begin with, in terms of just kind of establishing a little bit of the rationale, uh, last year Gary Bond, Bob Drake, and colleagues uh, did a review of research on first episode psychosis uh, programs and the effects of programs on work and school uh, functioning. Uh, and essentially what they found were a couple of uh, conclusions. Uh, the first was that programs that had a specific uh, vocational or vocational and educational focus tended to have better effects on vocational educational functioning than programs that didn't. Um, second observation was that of the different studies, the, the uh, uh, programs that were most likely, or the programs with vocational uh, and, ed and an educational focus, uh, tended to be supported employment and education uh, programs that were modeled on or based on the principles of IPS uh, supported employment, uh, which we'll be getting into uh, you know, a, in a little bit of time. Uh, and a meta-analysis of the three uh, controlled uh, trials of uh, SEE uh, programs and inspired by IPS uh, indicated uh, that uh, there were, was a 49% cumulative um, employment or involvement in, in school uh, rate for uh, participants who received uh, the SEE intervention uh, compared to 29% in the usual uh, um, uh, first episode uh, uh, treatment programs. Um, and then the last observation was that the effects of SEE programs um, tend to be uh, present in terms of improving uh, uh, vocational outcomes, work outcomes. Um, and if you break it out and you look specifically at school outcomes, it really remains to be convincingly demonstrated that these programs improve uh, uh, school outcomes. Um, one of the important things is that the IPS model of supported employment, which is frequently called a place train model, the philosophy is that you try to get people into a, um, a job that focuses on uh, competitive jobs and um, related to people's area of interest and, and background. The idea is that you try to get people into jobs fairly rapidly after an initial uh, uh, relatively brief assessment and no pre-vocational training. And then what you do is you provide supports and training to help the person stay um, in, the, um, uh, in the job or, or potentially to move on to another job, uh, which are provided on a time um, unlimited basis. Um, but one of the criteria, one of the, the basic principles of supported employment, it's called the zero exclusion criterion, and there is one, except one criterion, and that is the person has to want to work. And similarly, applications of supported employment and education in first episode psychosis programs have focused on people who have an established work or school goal. And that's a, an important issue, something that we're going to be coming uh, back to. So all the studies of supported employment and education programs in first episode psychosis programs have focused on people who wanted to work or go to school and then randomized to people who wanted to work or go to school to either get support employment and education or not. So what we really don't know is you take a full cohort of people with the first episode of psychosis enrolled in a coordinated specialty care uh, program. Uh, we don't know how many of them actually want to go to work, want to go to school. Um, and we don't know how many, uh, or we don't know what the magnitude of the effect would be of supported employment and education in an overall cohort of first episode psychosis uh, of patients. Now, if you talk about people with uh, um, multiple episodes of, of uh, 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 
uh, psychosis or severe mental illness, people with uh, severe mental illness, and you look at the rates of people who endorse going to work as a personal goal, most of those surveys, it's about 10, 10 to 12 of them, most of them indicate that somewhere between about 55 and 70 percent of people with a severe mental illness uh, want to return uh, to, to work. But there's very little, there's much less data about that in terms of first episode psychosis uh, clients. Um, there are at least some reasons to believe that the rates aren't necessarily higher. One might even speculate that the rates might be even lower, uh, potentially. Uh, there is a survey or study that was done by Ramsey of people with first episode psychosis. Um, and uh, a little bit over 50%, 51% indicated that um, getting a job, that um, work or school, returning to school, was one of their goals over the next three years. Um, so if you look at the focus on support, employment, and education, it's not whether you want to work or go to school in the next three years, it's whether you want to do that now. You know, that survey might indicate, gee, that maybe even under 50% of people with the first episode of psychosis see that. I mean, there are probably conflicting data, but the truth is that there are just not many data out there on that at all. So there were a number of research questions in this analysis that we sought to address. First was, does offering support, employment, and education to all people in a specialty care first episode psychosis program improve the work and school outcomes uh, compared to uh, uh, not offering uh, um, a su supported employment and, and, and education? Uh, what are its effects on the full co cohort? Then a second question is, does the receipt of supported employment and education services within a coordinated specialty care program account for any improvements in work or school uh, uh, functioning uh, that might be seen associated with that specialty care uh, program? Um, and a third slightly different question is, what are the effects of receiving disability? on the likelihood of going to school or work, because we know that people with the first episode of psychosis are often not receiving disability. There are often pressures to get on disability, especially in the US, because uh, often the, the, that kind of disability insurance is what pays uh, for people's uh, treatment, as well as provides some, uh, some amount, of, uh, amount of income. So uh, fortunately, uh, the Navigate program and the ETP study design have already been uh, uh, described. I, I want to mention one or two things that weren't previously mentioned and, and that are important when it comes to interpreting the results from our study as well as comparing it to the other Ray's uh, study and other first episode uh, programs in, in the U.S. in particular. First of all, the Navigate team uh, was not required to be a full-time uh, team of people because the NIMH requirement that, that was uh, part of the Ray's initiative was that um, they wanted a program that could be implemented in routine community treatment settings. Um, and if you think of routine community treatment settings, not every particular setting in a small rural area is going to be able to field a full-time first episode psychosis team. So it was a, a matter of practicality that uh, 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 Navigate team members did not have to be full-time team members. Second thing is that the programs were uh, incorporated into existing mental health services and mental health centers. They were not administratively separate units as they frequently are in, in Europe and, and Australia and, and, and so on, and even now in certain U, um, uh, U.S. programs as, as well. Um, and again, that had to do with the uh, integration uh, or with the requirement that it be uh, implemented in routine community settings uh, and settings that could be paid for by existing uh, mental health uh, insurance uh, uh, programs and, and the like. Uh, that's the third point. And then the last point is that um, part of implementing it into routine community settings was that it, these programs tended to serve the specific geographic catchment areas where they were located. They were not seeking referrals in a broad geographic area. Uh, and the differences between uh, seeking referrals from a broad geographic area without covering the entire area versus um, working within a particular catchment area are, are, I think, also important in terms of interpreting what we found. So um, Dell uh, already reviewed what Navigate was in terms of the uh, specific services provided in the program. Um, the Navigate team uh, had five people, a director, a psychiatrist. I think it was, we called them prescribers, but I believe that they were almost always, uh, if not always, uh, psychiatrists. One supported employment and education specialist and two individual uh, uh, resiliency training uh, specialists. Case management was sometimes provided by an additional person sometimes provided by, um, uh, by the IRT people. 
um, and occasionally provided by the SEE uh, specialists, uh, because they were the uh, people sometimes in the field and in a position to provide uh, case management. So support employment and education, as we said, based on IPS supported employment, focuses on helping people return to work and school, uh, preferably as rapidly uh, as possible. Goals are determined by the client's preferences. Uh, the focus is on providing supports to help the person enroll in school to get back to work, and then ongoing supports for them to actually learn how to uh, perform the job, to resolve certain problems at the job or, or in terms of school. There is rehabilitation in supported uh, employment, but the learning tends to happen more likely after placement rather than in preparation for a person uh, resuming a certain kind of role functioning. Um, it's all coordinated with the clinical team at the level of weekly navigate uh, team meetings. And uh, what we did in our adaptation, it's fairly practical, but we had the uh, support employment and, and uh, education specialists meet with every client um, who was enrolled in the Navigate program. We monitored this, and we have pretty close to 100% uh, of clients who were enrolled in, in RAISE ETP had at least one meeting with the SEE specialist. And the idea of this meeting was to kind of explore interest in work in school and um, the person had a goal, great to get working on it. If they weren't sure, if they were ambivalent, to kind of work with them. If they said no, to kind of back off and to work with the uh, to uh, work with the rest of the Navigate team, in, in the hopes that interest in returning to work in school would be would become a goal. But the whole the whole Navigate team was driven by client uh, uh, goals, um, and uh, well, I covered the SE specialist meeting, and John or Dell covered the whole. Uh, randomization, 34 sites, and the inclusion criteria, and the demographics. And so um, it's here important to talk a little bit about some of the implementation challenges associated with implementing the SEE component of the program in particular. Um, although the Navigate program was designed to basically provide services that could be reimbursed by existing uh, insurance reimbursement uh, uh, structures. That, that's the primary reason we didn't have assertive community treatment. You can't reimburse assertive community treatment in the United States unless you have a pattern of frequent hospitalizations or you could get forensic assertive community treatment reimbursed for people involved in the criminal justice system. There's no reimbursement mechanism for it in terms of first episode, although it should be and hopefully this is going to be uh, uh, revisited. But the other thing is supported employment and education or supported employment overall um, is a problem in terms of reimbursement in the United States. It can be reimbursed in some places, it can't be reimbursed in others. States can modify their Medicaid plans, which are very, very complex things. Um, and the upshot of it is that supported employment is currently not available in, on a routine basis, um, hardly anywhere in the United States. In certain states it is, and, and, and so on. But the penetration is still very low, largely because there's no single payer of um, the services associated with uh, supported employment. And there's recently an editorial that I did and a number of, you know, a lot of papers on the problem of the reimbursement of supported employment. So what we did was we built in five hours a week of supported employment into our overall, overall grant against the NIMH kind of requirements that everything be covered by uh, insurance uh, policies in order to ensure that at least some supported employment education was provided. And then the idea was that states were supposed to go out and get additional funding um, as needed to cover further services. And what happened is that five states basic, I mean, five sites basically provided five hours a week. Uh, nine sites expanded it to six to 10 hours a week. And three sites expanded it to over 10 hour, uh, uh, hours a week. And the upshot of this, uh, you may be concerned about, um, about uh, um, ratios of number of clients per SEE specialist, which might have been an issue, but probably the bigger issue is that Part of supported employment and education is job development and making connections with universities and things like that. And these are, are um, roles or activities that are typically not done with the client. And they're done in order to identify potential jobs, make connections and things like that. And so if you have too little time uh, devoted uh, to a person providing supported employment and education, they don't have the ability to make these kind of community connections. And it probably limits uh, their overall effectiveness. And, and this is one of the reasons why supported employment, you know, researchers, Bob Drake, and, and so on, why there's been a great deal of emphasis on training the skills um, of employment uh, of specialists in terms of doing a job development in the community. Um, some of this work, of course, being done uh, without, uh, without clients. Um, 
And so that's probably the most important issue. And I also mentioned that there was sometimes conflict in terms of case management. Um, generally speaking, supported employment, according to IPS, is defined partly by people having a sole focus on just providing um, employment or employment and education services. And we tried to hold to that, but because of the case management needs and because of the practicalities that the uh, SAE specialists were often in the community, which is another part of how the, the services uh, is defined, sometimes they were pulled into doing uh, a case management. So those were some of the implementation challenges. There were other challenging things in terms of doing a lot of remote training and, and, and things. And, and the other thing, other thing to bear in mind is that this is a little bit different than supported employment, IPS supported employment, where you have an entire program where you have a supervisor, a minimum of two full-time um, employment specialists who are providing the, the services. Here what we're doing is training a part-time SEE specialist serving on a multidisciplinary first episode psychosis team. So for that reason, the results you know, aren't directly comp uh, comparable uh, because the, the, the models are different and our model is designed to be implemented in, in any routine community setting, which you can't do with supported employment. So those are some kind of provisos uh, necessary when interpreting the findings. So what we did was we compared uh, Navigate with Community Care on work and school involvement. Uh, primarily using the monthly SURF ratings. These are client uh, um, interview-based ratings done on a monthly basis, fairly brief. There's about 30 kind of questions that people were asked, and including uh, whether people were in work or school, number of days, uh, also got information about hospitalizations and substance use and so on. Um, we decided to define receipt of three or more supported employment or otherwise vocational services as engagement in the SEE program, because we needed to have some kind of definition. We figured, okay, everybody was going to have one meeting, and then some people were going to have a second meeting, you know, kind of some ambivalence, but by the time you were getting to three meetings, okay, it was really, you know, you're exposed to the intervention for all practical purposes. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we defined that a priori in, in the analysis. Um, and then we evaluated whether engagement in support and employment uh, uh, mediated uh, improvements in work and school involvement. And then we looked at the effects of disability on um, uh, uh, subsequent work and school. So what this uh, depicts is the number of people who um, reported, uh, uh, it's the cumulative proportion of people with three or more uh, visits with the SEE specialist or or could be vocational specialist because we don't know in the community care sites generally they weren't providing supported employment but and the question that we got this information from had to do with whether they met with a, a, a vocational specialist which would include supported employment and what this shows is that the people in uh, the navigate program indeed received a lot more vocational uh, services um, you know defined in terms of receiving three or more services there was more engagement in a vocational rehabilitation program in Navigate than there was in community care. So it's a, a basic kind of a validity check, you could say. Um, what this depicts is the percentage of people with any work or school days per month um, over the two year period. Uh, and uh, this is um, significant, I guess the P level is off of is off this when you, you know, controlling for baseline levels, remember there was a significantly higher rate of uh, uh, involvement in work in school in the community care sites than the Navigate site. Um, and what this shows is that the Navigate uh, program essentially caught up and at some points uh, surpassed um, the community care sample in rates of school and work involvement. It's a little easier to see if you uh, look at, at rates of work or school uh, aggregated over a six month period of time. And this is what, uh, what it looks like here. Um, and then this is uh, what, what happens when you look at it in terms of, uh, well, these are the fitted lines, uh, you know, essentially uh, over time. You can see navigate essentially catching up um, to community care. And this is looking at it when you add in the issue of did people receive three or more supported uh, employment uh, services? Were people exposed to supported employment? And so when you add in the interaction with exposure to uh, supported uh, employment, uh, what you get is a significant uh, interaction which essentially supports the mediator um, hypothesis. And what you can see is that second to bottom line, those are the people in Navigate who received three or more supported employment services. And you can, say, you can see they go up um, more and faster than anybody else uh, goes up in terms of their involvement in, in work and school. So uh, this test essentially supported the mediator um, hy hypothesis that uh, receipt of 
um, uh, or engagement in uh, supported employment and education uh, uh, accounted for the better work and school outcomes. Um, a few other findings, the total percentage uh, of people, well, first of all, the rates of work and school involvement at the beginning of the study were, were low, 25% uh, uh, and 37% in, in the two conditions. Um, a little bit under 70% of the people in the Navigate program engaged in the supported em employment program. And so that number is kind of approximately in the middle of surveys of, of people with severe mental illness in terms of interest in, in, uh, um, in, in getting a job. But another interesting thing is, was, was to note that about half of the people who were engaged in the program weren't fully engaged until more than six months into the program. So it could mean that motivation to work grew gradually. It could mean that certain kind of symptoms, other impairments really interfered with, with motivation. It was important to have a kind of a comprehensive program in order to be able to, to jump on motivation uh, uh, when it, uh, uh, it developed. Um, when we looked at individual analyses uh, of the effects of Navigate versus community care on work outcomes and separately on school outcomes, they were not significant. So this is a reflection of the fact that the effects that we're seeing while significant and consistent and while mediated by receipt of services um, are not especially strong uh, effects. Um, separate analyses I'm not presenting now, but we, um, we did see that receipt of Social Security uh, reduced the likelihood of a person subsequently returning to, uh, to work or, or, um, or school. Um, and so just a couple of, uh, of comments. Uh, this is the first study to evaluate support employment and education model in the context of a full cohort of people receiving uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, a community care for first episode uh, of psychosis. And the, and the first study to demonstrate a moderation effect of the supported employment and education components of that program in terms of, uh, of explaining um, outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, the, mo the magnitude of the effects were modest, um, and uh, a full 30% of the uh, people never, uh, never uh, received more than three uh, services, and we take that as kind of a proxy for not having been, been interested in, in school. A um, couple of discussion items raises the question of whether there's a mismatch between requiring that people have a, mo a, um, a goal for work and school at the beginning of a first episode psychosis program in order to receive support and employment and, uh, and education services. And also raises questions about whether motivational work may, be, may have a, uh, a role to play in increasing the engagement of people earlier on. And not just motivational work, but exploring career options and, and things like that, that are not typically so much within the purview of, of traditional supported education and, and uh, um, uh, employ employment. Um, I've noted the low rates of work and school involvement at baseline, and I think this is important because if you look at the rates of some of the other non-navigate uh, first episode psychosis programs in the U.S., you see much, much higher rates. For example, in the Connection program, and in the STEP program, Srihari's a, a program, you see rates over, uh, over 50%. Um, and it's my speculation um, that it may reflect differences in the recruitment strategies uh, in terms of uh, serving a defined catchment area versus recruiting from a broad geographic area, which could, in effect, result in skimming or selecting uh, better pre-morbid functioning and more intact uh, families and people who are more likely to want to go to work. And at that point, I can tell I'm getting, about to get yanked off the stage. I went off over a little bit, for which I apologize. Uh, but hopefully, this will give some additional uh, uh, um, stimulus for uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we we're fortunate to have Bob Heinzen as a discussant to, uh, to put all of this in perspective. So I'm mindful that this discussion is between you and the break, so I'm going to do the speed dating version of a, of a discussion. Uh, so first I want to, I want to thank uh, the presenters here. Uh, th this uh, symposium gives you uh, a good idea that we got the right team to do the, um, the RAISE project. Uh, I spoke this morning about how the results have led to broad implementation, but here you're hearing about the really terrific science that they produced. And uh, I'll note that in this project, uh, there have already been six major data papers that have come out of this project, which is a, a phenomenal rate of productivity in a relatively short period of time. And here we've heard uh, about uh, some analyses that will lead uh, to additional papers. 
So I'm going to use uh, Nina Schooler's presentation as kind of the frame uh, for my discussion. Nina uh, reminded us that cognitive deficits are uh, frequently observed in first episode psychosis. And some of those problems, um, the typical problems in memory and organization and problem solving really impair uh, the functional capacity of people with first episode psychosis. Um, in 2008, the evidence wasn't strong enough for specific cognitive remediation uh, strategies to be included in RAISE, but the investigators chose to measure cognition to see what kinds of effects would be observed over time in the comprehensive uh, treatment program. So uh, Navigate shows uh, that there are benefits uh, to uh, the coordinated specialty care in terms of improved cognition, which leads us uh, to wonder that maybe the, uh, maybe in the next iteration of um, uh, a RAISE type of project, uh, whether more uh, uh, interventions that more specifically target uh, cognition would uh, pay further benefits in terms of addressing some of these cognitive deficits and perhaps having spillover effects into other areas of functioning. Um, John Kane uh, spoke to us about uh, the, uh, uh, the hospitalization uh, data uh, that have come out of the RAISE project. And then in his um, analysis of what may have, uh, what, what factors may be related to uh, relapse and rehospitalization, he talked about the potential role of adding long-acting injectable medications as a, as a strategy that would help in relapse prevention. And here, um, I actually would tie this back to the discussion of cognition. When we think that um, if, if somebody is taking an oral medication that actually uh, presents a cognitive burden for them or a cognitive load in terms of having to remember to take the, the medication and to actually make the decision on a daily basis that I need to, to take the medicine. When you move to a long-acting uh, formulation, you remove a lot of those, uh, that, that cognitive load from a person who, who has uh, limited cognitive capacity to begin with. They don't need to remember on a daily basis, nor do they need to expend cognitive energy to, to uh, rededicate themselves to the decision to take the medicine. So there may be uh, the long-acting injectable option may be re uh, additionally related to this uh, issue of cognitive, uh, uh, poor cognitive performance. Um, Delbert Robinson uh, spoke to us about the COMPASS intervention. And here, one thing that Delbert didn't mention that I think is, is worth uh, pointing out. In the United States, uh, first episode psychosis is a, is a relatively rare phenomenon. So most psychiatrists don't encounter cases of first episode psychosis in their routine care. When they do, those cases are a real anomaly. And when faced with decisions about prescription practices, it's most likely that physicians will fall back on the medical heuristics that they've developed for managing uh, uh, cases of established schizophrenia, higher doses, multiple antipsychotic medications, et cetera. Compass actually uh, is a cognitive prosthetic that, uh, uh, th that overcomes this tendency to fall back into heuristics that don't match the needs of people with first episode psychosis. It's a very sophisticated decision aid that brings first episode psychosis psychopharmacology into the tool set of, of clinicians who work in com non-academic community settings and have low exposure to this population. So I think that's a, uh, as far as implementation broadly in the United States, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, here uh, in, in talking about uh, Kim Muser's presentation of supported employment, I have to break away from the, the cognitive framework. Uh, but uh, again, this was uh, very, very interesting in that uh, Ray's ETP embraced a cohort of individuals who had varying uh, degrees of interest in uh, supported employment at the start of treatment. Here I want to emphasize one point that I think is really critical from Kim's presentation. 50% of the individuals involved in, this in the Navigate treatment program did not embrace supported employment until after a year, well, after six months of treatment, which means that maybe vocational goals are something that uh, emerge over time for a significant portion of uh, first episode patients. And having a treatment program 
where there's individual therapy, family therapy, and psychopharmacology, each of which is asking the person about their goals and their ambition. These ancillary treatments may help to uh, ignite interest in uh, work and then having the support and employment as, a, as an element that the person can be referred to is a tremendous advantage. So it tells us that even though people may not express interest initially, we should not give up on them. We should keep cultivating that interest and motivation and then having the service there uh, gives tremendous benefit. So it has been a, a real uh, pleasure and an honor over eight years to be associated with this RAISE team. It was an honor to be uh, uh, invited to be the discussant, and I hope I repaid you with a very short discussion so now you can get to your coffee. Thank you.